Hey there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Badass Banking. And I've got a badass bankerly, credit unionly person online today. Her name is Sarah Cook, and she is ready for this, always cooking up something really good. Sarah, how are you today? Uh, you probably couldn't see me roll my eyes under the sunglasses, but <laughs> thank I'm you for that introduction. I'm doing well. How about you, Brian? I, I can't complain. I'm rolling my, my eyes too. And, and I promise not to play any of the video that we just shot earlier. I will not do that. <laughs> so Sarah is a uh, business and communication strategist. Is that a good way to describe what you do? Fundamentally? I believe so, yes. Okay. And you deliver a market first innovation and communication and business product development strategy for your clients. And your clients are, are they mostly credit unions and QSOs? Uh, they're primarily financial services business partners, um, uh, a few credit unions in there as well. Does that mean you have a couple banks as well? I don't yet, but I no. de definitely some of my, uh, my clients do serve banks for sure. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. The, the, the credit union versus bank dispute has been going on so long. I, I leave this to the lobbyists <laughs> and, you know, to the, uh, the CUNAs and the ABAs of the world. They can, they can fight it all out. It's probably job security for all of them. Exactly. I, I get it. I don't know if the average consumer really thinks twice about credit union versus bank or bank versus credit union. I, I think what they look for is the best experience at, at the right moment. By the way, you are in Maryland, right? Hence, I am, sir. So I'm, I'm trying to stick with a, a theme with my Zoom background. I know Shevlin, Shevlin put it out there, and I think it was directed at me. He doesn't, <laughs> like, he doesn't like the Zoom backgrounds. I do have a a Ron Shevlin background. I could put that up, but I'm going to stick with crabs because Maryland is for crabs. At least that's what they used I to I hope say. that's what you were insinuating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of ways we can go with that. So, so tell me a little about some of the stuff you're working on right now. So yeah, I, uh, as you mentioned, business communication strategy, uh, a lot about branding, thought leadership and lead generation, all the, the main areas of, of marketing and uh, communications. Um, I have done everything from strategy and business plans and market research and, uh, you know, and, and sometimes it kind of surprises me. Some of the companies that I work with, they range from startups to companies that have been, been, yeah, been in business for decades and they ha can't answer the basic questions about who they are as a company or who your ideal clients are, or what are your goals? Um, so, you know, a lot of times we end up working on that before we can get to the content strategy and execution. Um, yes. Yeah, so from there, I generally uh, provide recommendations for branding and thought leadership, uh, which is a lot of content marketing and, and lead generation as well. Uh, building content calendars, SEO, corporate newsletters, social media, I would, kind of runs the gamut. And then of course, public relations, given my background. Um, and, and, and that background is uh, editor at uh, chief, editor in chief, right? At CU Times. Publisher and editor in chief. Publisher editor too. Um, wow. Yeah. I ran, I ran the, both sides of the business is essentially the president and CEO of a company. Um, and that was, that was a lot of fun. And I think, you know, one of the things I really liked about it, and I, I'm sure we'll kind of talk about this because we're talking about badass banking is how to, um, you know, align your audience with your revenue generation so that it all makes sense for everybody. Um, I think appeasing the audience, giving them what they want and what they need, um, whether that's your members or your clients, um, can often be tied to a trend, uh, that you can find in your revenue growth. Right. And so using that, as a starting point for your strategy um, is critical. Um, so that was one of the things, you know, marrying the audience needs uh, with the advertiser needs at the time when I was with Credit Union Times. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it goes back to the old premise, know thy market, right? And, and understand the point of pain in the industry and or with that prospect or client, and then make sure your value prop is positioned as a solution. And, and that's why when I was in, you know, on the banking side, on the client side, both as a bank banker and as a credit union or when I was at Affinity years ago, um, I, I hated to talk about selling product. To me, it was selling help, advice, 
and solutions. And, and solutions include, you know, the products that we in the industry offer. But those products, fundamentally, they're commoditized. Mm-hmm. And, and even fintech startups that approach me and, and probably that approach you, their, their pitches are typically all about them and not about what the audience wants to hear. How about from a PR point of view? I mean, I, I've got, I know we've got people in the audience, I, and I work with a couple of them, some startups. What's your advice to them as a former editor-in-chief and publisher and, and how they pitch to the media? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I saw some really stinky ones across over my time. I and mean, we, we, we literally get 400 a day. Wow. And so right from the start, you got to stand out. Um, and so I think all of the conversation that we're, that's going to go on today is about knowing your audience in any relationship, whether it's your wife, whether it's your client, whether it's, you know, whoever, know who you're speaking to and what makes them tick. Um, you know, make reporters care about your story. Uh, believe it or not, they are human. <laughs> we are. Right. We are. And um, so whether you're making a call or sending a press release, you always have to think about what their audience is interested in because that's what they're interested in um, on a professional level, on a personal level, uh, building a rapport with them. Um, not that you're going to like share state secrets or anything, but you know, building a rapport so that you understand what makes them tick. Are they ambitious? Or are they, um, you know, just looking to fill the spot and move on with life? Um, And then, you know, when you can especially uh, provide a client and personalize it, or as a credit union um, or a bank, your, your members and your customers, personalizing how you help them, you know, you get that used car they needed to be able to go to their two different jobs and support their family. You know, um, those kind of personal stories really make a huge difference in getting noticed. Yeah, what, what you're talking about, uh, if I were to translate, is really conversation. It's the art of conversation. And, and conversation starts, I think, especially when it comes to the media um, and, and your, obviously your, your members or your customers, if you're a bank or credit union, it starts with listening right? What, what am I hearing, seeing, and noting? And, and then how can I present myself in a conversation or establish a dialogue that's relevant and contextual? And, and, and I think that's something that, that is painfully missing from the bulk of the players out in the industry, both on the FinServe side, be it a bank or credit union, as well as FinTech. And I, I know that's lacking when startups do a pitch. It's always look at me, look at me, look at me. And, you know, I don't think the average startup understands, um, or maybe even the, the average bank marketer that the media, they're looking for new and fresh stories, mm-hmm. right? They're not looking for the, the same old thing. So let's, let's uh, turn the page on that one just a bit. Talk about um, what are some of the big stories that you're hearing right now and some of the big news that you're hearing among your clients as it pertains to um, really the COVID situation. Are there specific worries? Um, do you think that most of them are doing okay? Or, or, or do you think there's some dark times ahead? Well, uh, specifically as it relates to Corona, but also the um, Black Lives Matter movement as well kind of came along a month or so later. And I think one of the things I've worked on with all of my clients is um, while we maintain the same strategy in their communications, some of the tactics or the messaging might have to have to change. Um, You know, you're not when Corona first hit and, you know, unemployment skyrocketed, credit unions weren't making and still aren't making and, and banks, I'm sure, too, a hell of a lot of loans. And so for my clients that help market loans (laughs) or help support lending in other ways, how are we going to still make it relevant? And so making the messaging about, okay, what is specific to Corona and the, and its impact and how we can use that to provide a message of help without looking like you are taking advantage, which is very complicated. It's very nuanced. Um, And uh, you know, some, uh, are able to conceptualize that kind of idea uh, and accept it better than others. Um, 
but you know so we we actually saw some fits and starts where it's like okay we got to rework it and then and, and then you know a few weeks after corona you get your messaging straightened out and that kind of stuff and then it's like all of a sudden it's this movement um which not all of a sudden it's been going on for hundreds of years you know there's this movement of protesters um against the uh unjust treatment of of black people within you know by the police departments um or individual bad police i don't believe police departments are bad in and of themselves um <clears throat> there are many good people uh working for the police department and keeping us all safe no doubt um, about it but at the same time you know we fully acknowledge that there have been injustice injustices excuse me um toward you know the black community toward the gay community toward women i mean um this is kind of a fire starter for sure and so you know also do you go out with a corporate message right um do you or what does that corporate message look like what does your company look like so you or what do you do so you can stand behind the fact that you live this and breathe this and so it's not um just a statement and it's right. not just a one-time donation i think the netflix um putting you know a lot of their funds into some you know minority owned banks and credit unions including hope credit union that was an amazing move it was an amazing way for credit unions to get some attention mm -hmm. um and i hope that uh they keep moving forward different companies keep moving forward with stuff like that because those kind of activities just demonstrate who you really are as a company yeah yeah now and i would agree diversity is not a, a slogan it's not a it's not a a brand message that's just put on paper it's got to be a belief it's got to become mm -hmm. part of your dna and you know uh, those injustices are being brought to the forefront where we're seeing them um, there's a kind of a woke moment occurring and, and it is an opportunity for the industry to kind of wake up and, and, um, get closer to a, a market that needs the attention and, and needs the, really the help. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm real concerned personally about the small business market right now. Um, all of it, you know, minority owned as well as, you know, small business in general. I, I don't think we know fully yet what's going to happen as a result of this pandemic. I know locally here in Williamsburg, Virginia, my wife's had some conversations with restaurant owners and um, to be blunt, they're scared shitless. Mm -hmm. You know, they just don't, by the way, you're allowed to swear on my channel. Okay. Um, so they, they just don't, they just don't know what's coming. There's a tidal wave out there somewhere, you know, a tsunami maybe that's slowly coming toward us. I saw Brett King today talking about uh, what's happening in New York City? A quarter of uh, uh, all all renters uh, missed paying their I think it was a March or April payments. Um, that's that's unbelievable. I responded by saying, "What about commercial real estate?" Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, there's going to be. I would hate to be running a commercial real estate investment trust right about now. That'd be right. that would be frightening. Um, let's talk about your clients. Do you have a Do you have a favorite client? Are you Are you, are you allowed to say that? Yeah. One, well, no, I would never say that because smart. I'm a communications person. <laughs> yeah, smart, smart. Anything, um, anything your clients are doing that, that is really standing out that you're super proud of or super psyched about? There are several, and I think that's really what I like most about being self-employed and picking and choosing, um, you know, who I want to work with and how I want to work with them. Um, there, so one company, Mitchell Stankovic and Associates, um, their strategic planning and organizational uh, development firm. They host these underground collisions. I don't know if you've ever attended, um, but we do have a virtual one coming on uh, the 15th, next okay. Wednesday, <laughs> if this publishes. Send, send me the info. I'll put it in the comments. I'll put Will the info there. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, and I, I know I listened to your recording with James Robert uh, earlier today and you know, he talked about Maslow's hierarchy and that's what we really follow at the underground. Um, you know, the, the safety, the security, the personal fulfillment, you know, all, all the different stages. And so, you know, we really get raw about personalization and banking and using data to get to that. And, you know, in DC in February, we talked about mental illness and how that impacts people in their finances and mm -hmm. how can credit unions, this particular client is focused on credit unions, how can credit unions do a better job of fulfilling the entire holistic human rather than just serving their, their 
financial needs because that is how you decommoditize financial services, right? Right. Um, you know, we talk about diversity and, and, as, and taking action. It's not just about talking all the time. So we've launched uh, or CU Pride. I don't know if you've heard of that group um, is launched out of that uh, as well as, you know, the Mitchell Stankovic has become a founding partner of this credit union DEI collective. Um, so there's lots of, of people there who are, yes, doing the thought leadership piece, but also walking the talk. So yeah. that's yeah. really awesome. Um, and uh, CU Strategic Planning, um, they, they're a firm that works with uh, community development financial institutions. Mm -hmm. They do strategic planning, product service development, um, CDFI grant applications. And so, um, you know, one of, one of their clients, uh, I got the wonderful opportunity to interview um, is uh, Southern Security Federal Credit Union. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they work with prisoners who are about 18 months from parole. They provide them financial counseling. They help them get a job, help them find safer housing, all these things, bus passes to make sure they don't, their recidivism rate has been going down because of the credit union's efforts. That kind of stuff is chilling and mind blowing. I, that's the kind of people I want to work with. And, um, you know, Saratech, uh, which is another another client of mine, um, they're a credit data driven um, marketing, um, financial financial education, and risk management firm. We're running this series of credit union superheroes right now. It was the impetus was the coronavirus, but plan on continuing it. And this little uh, Santa Cruz community credit union. Um, I interviewed uh, Beth Carr, who's the CEO there uh, for this series. And throughout the corona, this, this I think it's about a $100 million credit union, processed millions in business loans. Mm -hmm. They collaborated with the city, collaborated with the county to cash the federal government checks for people who didn't have bank accounts. They handed out uh, government money for grants to the small businesses. Their employees were up all hours of the night. We all heard about the problems with the PPP loans. All hours of the night processing those loans and saved 1,300 jobs. That's crazy. I mean, that's is, awesome. Is, yeah, it's the it, it it's so exciting. But I mean, I think there's also the less sexy side of it, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily consumer facing, but gives a, a better experience. And that's like um, Digital Line is a startup company I'm working with that does mm -hmm. uh, business process transformation work with banks and credit unions, and um, you know. Gisa Credit Union, which is a huge credit union out mm -hmm. in Washington, they uh, streamlined so far 60% of their mortgage process. And now the credit union went from not being able to handle all the applications, not being able to find qualified mortgage processors in their area because of the housing boom. Then the Fed drops the rate 150 basis points because of coronavirus, and they are swamped, but they had already started this um, you know, an automation process. Now they, they're handling three times the loans with no trouble. Um, you know, that's, that's really, um, just really cool. But it's, it's the back office stuff that people don't necessarily yeah. pay as much attention to. It doesn't get the news because it's, it's not sexy. Yeah. I mean, um, I work with uh, Open Lending, which is, I mean, their, their CEO is a, a former um, credit union CEO and they just went mm -hmm. public. That was really exciting time, um, but they they take alternative data. Um, they have a proprietary system added to the FICO scores, rescore people, um, add, add default insurance for auto loans, so, and they're able to uh, predict default with ninety nine more than ninety nine percent accuracy, and then insure it on the back end when it doesn't quite work out sometimes. And so banks and credit unions feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm making loans to borrowers who have lower credit scores. And so this is how you decommoditize banking. These credit unions and these companies are not going to allow it to happen. That is bad ass banking. Yeah, no, I love I love that. And you're a hundred percent on the money when you talk about that back office. The front office cannot operationalize unless the back office does because the back office controls much more of that consumer experience mm -hmm. than people realize it may not be sexy, but in fact, it really is one of the most sexiest parts of financial technology, yeah. uh, credit union and compliance. bank operations. Com <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't even get me done. I'm not going to do a show on compliance. <laughs> I refuse to, 
But yeah, no, I, I think you're hundred percent right. I mean, you, you just described what it takes to make things a lot more badass. Now, I don't know if banking per se can ever be, it can ever be badass from a customer point of view. I mean, <laughs> no one's, no one's fired up to go apply for a loan or, Hey honey, <laughs> want to go pay the bills together? I mean, right. It, it just doesn't happen, but we can remove the friction. We can less, you know, make banking less of a chore. Well, I know we're running out of time. Any last minute plugs you want to make or anything more we, know, we need to know about you? I'm going to put a lot of your info in the comments section below. I'm going to mention all the brands you mentioned. It's a lot. You know, I'm pretty impressed. You're doing some cool <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah, so I would say um, to wrap it up, and we talked a, a lot at the beginning about public relations. And I think, you know, in any relationship, any relationship, it's knowing and understanding your audience, knowing what makes them tick, and then presenting that in a light that works. Because I think credit unions in particular, but also community banks and and some other companies, they they are, I don't know if they're scared to share their story. They're too busy to share their story. They don't, a lot of them don't recognize they have a story, but they all do. And that's what keeps you from being a commodity industry. Right. Is, yeah, is yeah. being uh, having a personality having a making a difference yeah and, and and we're all in the business of storytelling we just have to be uh, you know a little more uh, bold and you know those stories make our brands genuine that that's mm -hmm. part of that decommoditization that's occurring well listen yeah. i appreciate your time today uh you're doing some remarkable stuff i'm super excited that you're on the show you're one of my favorite people. I've known you Aww. for a hell, hell of a long time. I don't think I've seen that you old. since, since that bar in Nashville, right? Last time I saw you was in a bar in Nashville. Yeah, a NAFQ conference, I think. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> NAFQ, yeah, yeah. I'm actually talking to a former NAFQ guy later on today, Dave, Fr Dave Frankel. Well, oh, look, yeah. I, I appreciate it, um, uh, uh, and uh, I look forward to talking to you soon, and I'll probably have you back on again, maybe with a couple other folks. How's That'd that be going? awesome. All right. Thank you, All Brad. Right. Thank you all.